All right. Well, th thank you, everyone. Thank you for the organizers for having me here today. Um, I realize that I'm speaking in a darkened room after lunch, uh, and it's right before discussion, so I'm going to be intentionally provocative today. And uh, I can tell because I triggered Lewis during lunch. So um, you know, we'll, we'll have to see how this goes. Um, so this is the title that I gave the organizers. But really, what I'm going to talk about today can better be described as failing forward. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm supposed to stand in front of a, a camera. I sort of tend to wander. Um, there's, there's a lesson there somewhere. Um, but the, really, it's more like failing forward. You know, how, when we're developing these animal models and using them, can we learn from our mistakes? Uh, and how can that be used for the betterment of the field? And so uh, over the last several years, my lab has been involved in the development of macaque models for a variety of uh, new viruses, including the PEGI viruses, the simian arteri viruses, uh, and Zika virus. And in all of these cases, we had to make a bunch of design decisions when we were trying to create our models uh, that would faithfully recapitulate the aspects of the infection that we were trying to model, uh, as Jeff alluded to this morning, uh, while also making the sort of pragmatic decisions that are necessary to uh, make a system tractable. Uh, and in macaques, as I'm sure all of you are aware, this involves the fact that you have very small sample sizes. And so you can, that limits the number of uh, uh, permutations that can be tested and really limits you to taking some really strategically placed bets on where you think the results are likely going to lead. And it should also be mentioned that the expensive husbandry cost of macaques uh, does also put some real constraints on what you can do in terms of long-term studies, especially for viruses like SIV uh, and like the arteriviruses that are persistent. Uh, we have to balance the need to get results quickly with the fact that the diseases that we're trying to model probably play out over many, many years. And so when we're developing these models, we have to ask some of the same questions that you've already heard uh, Jeff allude to earlier. What are you trying to actually model, and does the macaque infection faithfully recapitulate that? When we're trying to consider the virus, so the viruses that we're using, uh, are they appropriate? Do they need to be host adapted uh, so that they can uh, replicate effectively through either rational uh, design or in vivo passage? Does the species matter? So earlier we heard about macaques, both pigtail, rhesus, Indian rhesus, sino, Mauritian sino. Um, we, we tend to use what's often convenient and available to us, but these differences might matter. We have to consider sex as a biological variable. It's not always true that you can use macaques, I'm sorry, male or female macaques and expect them to behave the same. We have to think about biosafety considerations, both for the animals as well as the laboratory workers and the people who are going to be taking care of them. And then we have to ask, and perhaps most importantly, what are the things that we can learn from macaques that we can't learn any other way? either through human uh, challenge studies or through uh, studies of uh, cell culture or other lower animal models. And so our work with PEGI viruses provides a useful uh, model for thinking about some of these issues. So for those of you who aren't familiar with PEGI viruses, you may have heard of them by their older name of GBVC. And the kooky thing about GBVC uh, is that uh, when people are infected with HIV and are co-infected with GBVC and are viremic, they tend to do really well. Their prognosis is very good. Here you see all-cause survival of people who are co-infected uh, versus people who are uh, GBVC seropositive uh, versus people who are GBVC negative. And you can see that for, uh, and these are people who are HIV infected and not treated with antiretrovirals. Uh, there is a clear survivorship advantage to being GBVC viremic. Esper Callis and his colleagues in Sao Paulo have uh, shown that uh, immune activation is dampened by uh, GBVC, aka human PEGI virus, uh, in both the CD8 and CD4 compartments. And so this has led to the idea that perhaps this virus might be a useful adjuvant to antiretroviral therapy, because if we could knock down immune activation, perhaps we could get rid of some of the comorbidities that are associated with uh, HIV, even in people who are on uh, treatment. And so the first question we have to ask is, well, should we be worried about the PEGI viruses making people sick? And the answer is, well, we don't. Uh, whether we should or not, the operationally, we don't. We transmit PEGI virus hundreds of times each day in our blood supply simply because it's a bloodborne virus and we don't screen for it. So uh, we don't worry too much about human PEGI virus transmission. And so before we start modeling it in uh, macaques, we should ask, well, could we just use controlled human challenge models instead? 
They're increasingly common, and for a lot of things, these models have become increasingly valuable and really, really good. So whenever we're talking about macaque models, we also need to keep the CHIM systems in the back of our mind and ask what questions we could ask with the CHIMs. But the Hitchhiker's Guide seems to keep coming up today. Uh, at lunch, uh, I think uh, Jeff thought he had the answer to life, the universe, and everything when his lunch order was 42. Uh, and so I think that it's fair to say uh, that the best we can say about these PEGI viruses, though, isn't that they're harmless. It's that we believe that they are mostly harmless. And that is to say that Jack Stapleton and his colleagues have uh, been looking lately at uh, people who have lymphoma and looking for the presence of PEGI virus uh, in uh, large cohorts and has found a significant uh, lymphoma risk associated with PEGI virus positivity. Now, this data is still preliminary. Um, it's still very much in its infancy, um, and it will need to be substantiated and replicated in other studies. But it just goes to show the delicate balance that we have to uh, have between uh, rushing aggressively into human studies with something that seems to be safe before we know that to be really true and before we've done some gatekeeping on, um, uh, on safety in animal models that are tractable. And so in this way, the models can be informative for evaluating the risks and benefits, in this case, of something like PEGI virus biotherapy. So what are the, be the prerequisites for a PEGI virus HIV co-infection model? Well, we need a species that can be uh, productively infected with uh, viruses that recapitulate key features of both the HIV and PEGI virus infections. We need viruses that can be used for the experimental challenges, which becomes particularly tricky for the PEGI viruses since, since they cannot be cultured in vitro. Um, since we're mainly interested in using this as an adjuvant for ART, uh, we need to make sure that our model is uh, susceptible to HIV antiretroviral drugs. And we need to have tractable experimental timelines. Outcomes that take decades to manifest themselves or are exceedingly rare are not practical in um, macaque models. And so those in the room who have studied Zika are very familiar with this, uh, as we've been under a lot of pressure to try to recapitulate microcephaly in uh, Zika pregnancies. And microcephaly is of exceedingly rare uh, outcome in uh, women who uh, are, in fact, are, are infected with Zika uh, during pregnancy. So if it happens one in 10 times um, in humans, you would need something like 100 monkeys to see that same sort of phenotype 10 times. That becomes not practical. And this gets to the final point, which is that we need reasonable effect sizes uh, to measure, to compare our, our groups and our controls. And so in this particular case, we're able to take advantage of the fact that SIV and SHIV infected macaques do model HIV pathogenesis well for the reasons you've heard earlier, and they can be treated effectively with uh, reverse transcriptase and integrase inhibitors. And fortuitously, as part of a viral discovery project that I was involved with, we discovered simian PEGI viruses uh, in free-living baboons in uh, Tanzania, and we were able to use blood from these animals to productively infect macaques, and the viral uh, load uh, for those infections is uh, shown on the right. And uh, I'm not going to get too much into the detail here, except to say that the simian PEGI virus infections are high titer, they're persistent, and they cause no overt pathology in the macaques, which is just like human PEGI virus. So in this sense, it seems to be uh, pretty faithful to what we know about human PEGI virus infections. So the first question we wanted to ask that we could only ask in monkeys is, well, what happens during acute SIV infection? Is there an effect on immune activation that is mediated very early on that means that people who are uh, pre-infected with GBVC or human PEGI virus are predisposed to a more positive outcome. You can't do this in people because most people are unaware of uh, recent HIV infections. We don't know uh, the sequencing of uh, infections in people. We don't know if they get infected with PEGI virus first or HIV first. We can uh, control this in um, macaques. And so in this study, we wanted to infect first with simian PEGI virus, then come back with SIV to test whether or not uh, the SPGV viremia limits the severity of primary SIV and leads to better long-term outcomes. But again, there are the caveats, and we need to be aware of these from the outset. The effect size needs to be large enough to yield robust results. There might be sex differences, uh, and we're not entirely sure whether the biomarkers that we're using of acute infection are predictive of long-term outcomes. So we designed a study that looked like this. This will look familiar to most of you. I won't spend too long on it. We used a female a Mauritian cinemologus macaques in this study. 
Uh, four got simian pegi virus, four were mock infected. We waited about a month. Uh, then we uh, challenged both groups with SIV max 239 NEF open, and then we monitored the animals uh, for four months. So, so did we see a difference between these two groups? No. Uh, for a long answer, it got cut off. Uh, we published this back in 2017. So this is um, an example of a story where we wanted to fail forward. We learned quite a bit about the simian pegi viruses and SIV during acute infection, but we did not see the sort of protective effect. We didn't really see any significant differences between the two groups uh, that we could attribute to the simian pegi virus infection. And so now we're asking a second question, which is, does the simian pegi virus infection affect immune activation during antiretroviral treatment? Because again, this is what we would be wanting to model if we were going to be using the simian pegi virus as a biotherapy. So could we give um, monkeys first, and then eventually people, a pegivirus biotherapy to reduce all-cause morbidity due to excessive immune activation. This could be done in humans, but again, there would be safety risks that would be prohibitive until we can know more about the risk-benefit ratio. Right now, there's all risk and only a hypothetical benefit. We still have some of the same caveats as before. So again, even though simian pegivirus did not modulate acute uh, SIV infection, a pegivirus biotherapy after long-term infection might be relevant. And so this is a study that is just under, underway now, where we have uh, six male and two female um, macaques. We're infecting them with 239, NEF open. Uh, we're treating with um, antiretrovirals uh, to bring the viruses to undetectable levels, at which point we will challenge with uh, simian pegivirus and we'll monitor for four months. And so by this time next year, we should have a good understanding of whether or not uh, there was any sort of salutary effect of the uh, pegiviruses on uh, immune activation during chronic infection. But the key thing is that as we're designing these studies, we have to expect that they're going to fail. And we want these studies to then fail productively. What do we mean by failing productively? Well, I think it means that we have to be transparent in our study design, our data collection, and our publication. It's great to see that ASM and some of the other publishers are making it easy for people to put their preprints into BioArchive. That's fantastic. It's, been a, it's something that we should all consider doing. But I think that we, as a non-human primate research field, uh, have an obligation both uh, to the rest of the community, to the funders, and uh, to the animals to be even more transparent than most when it comes to sharing information on our studies. I would wager that in this room we probably have hundreds, if not thousands, of animals that have gone into our studies for which no data has ever been uh, published in a scientific journal. And that's something that we're not going to be able to go back in history and change, but it's something that we should think about going forward. What are the ways that we could be more transparent about all of our results in a way uh, that not only uh, is transparent about the viral challenges, as Jeff said earlier, but captures all of, the, uh, in, all of the things that go on in a study, both those things that work and the things that don't, because these studies are very expensive. They're using uh, animals that we use because they're most like us, and we really need to do everything we can to make sure that, that we prize uh, that resource for as valuable as, as it is. Uh, and that's something where I feel like, you know, collectively and as a community, we can do better. And we also need to try to make sure that our results uh, not only are useful in and of themselves, but that they also should inform and improve uh, the care and use of the macaques and should uh, allow us to be uh, ever more creative in figuring out what these models can and cannot tell us. When we first started studying Zika virus, uh, we realized it was going to be a very short infection. It was going to play itself out over the course of about 10 days. And we only study an SIV maybe one day seven time point, maybe a day 10 time point if we're doing frequent sampling during acute infection. And we discovered that it was, in fact, possible to sample animals every day. It totally changed our minds on what was possible in the model when we just had to approach it with a clean slate. Similarly, I think that there is another clean slate that many of us are approaching as we now move from using untreated SIV and SHIV infected animals into animals that are being treated with ARVs. In people, we say if you're undetectable, you're untransmittable. This is the CDC's guidance. It's substantiated by huge amounts of data. And yet at my center, and I'm sure at many of yours, we still follow some of the same husbandry practices that were established 25 years ago before there was 
uh, uh, effective antiretroviral treatment, and certainly before we have the data that suggests that things like um, more social housing, uh, better pair housing, better uh, enrichment is available to animals if those animals are not at risk of transmitting the virus to uh, cage mates or to uh, social partners. And this is something where even if I'm wrong, and there is a risk in monkeys that is not apparent in humans, we can learn that. That's something that, that is a knowable unknown, whether or not uh, we can do better in terms of taking animals that are on antiretrovirals and putting them into more social housing and, and, and using our new information about HIV transmission to inform how we care for our SIV and SHIV infected animals on treatment. So with that, I'm going to close by just saying that these cross-species transmission models uh, can be really valuable for understanding pathogenesis and testing uh, countermeasures for viruses that are difficult to study in humans and where other non-primate non animal models are insufficient. But our models are really difficult, expensive, time-consuming, and frustrating. And so we need to build failure into the experimental plan and figure out how we can best leverage that failure in a way that moves the entire field forward. And we should really work to document our failures as well as our successes. Um, and so I would encourage people to think about forms of open data sharing. Um, and I would go as so far as to say that uh, being uh, more open should be mandatory for grantees to avoid uh, redundant redundancy and uh, avoidable mistakes. So with that, I'd like to thank the people in my group who have been working on the Pegivirus projects, uh, uh, Christina, Adam, Elizabeth, uh, my close colleagues at UW-Madison, our Primate Center, um, Esper at the University of Sao Paulo, and of course, NIAID and ORIP. So with that, I'll stop. Thank you. Questions, comments? Jonas Asher from OHSU. Great talk, Dave. Um, do you think, you know, since we're talking about models, and you chose Mauritian cinemologus macaques, which I love, but the viral loads in the chronic phase in those animals are usually about a log and a half lower than they are in rhesus macaques. Do you think you would have seen an effect if you did it in rhesus macaques, and do you think you should repeat it in rhesus macaques? Yeah, it's a great question. So what would have happened if we had done the simian pegivirus work in rhesus instead of in Mauritian cinos? And the answer is we don't know. Uh, that was a a question that we had to uh, wrestle with when we first started the, the study. Um, and at the time, we didn't have, I'll be honest, we didn't have a particularly good reason for choosing Sinos uh, versus Rhesus um, because at the time that we first started the study, the biggest barrier that we had to cross was we had to get a baboon virus, so an African virus, into an Asian monkey. So we first infected Sinos with the virus, and so we then had an amplified stock of the simian pegivirus in Sinos. Had we brought that back over to Rhesus, we would have needed potentially to do the same sort of thing that uh, you guys have done with CMV and worried about whether there was going to be species specificity in the pegiviruses. So once we started down the road of using Sinos, we uh, were sort of locked into that for, you know, expedience. Could you just tell me, just I'm speaking out of ignorance because I didn't read that paper. So the, the rationale for uh, using these viruses, uh, do they infect uh, similar target cells than HIV or do they, what, what was the, the basic rationale? Yeah, so they're incredibly enigmatic viruses, these pegiviruses. So um, they uh, are thought to potentially infect some of the same target cells, but they're very, very difficult to see um, ex vivo, and no one has been able to culture them successfully in vitro. So we're reliant on taking biopsies and doing things like RNA scopes. So um, our colleague Kevin Zhang has visualized um, pegivirus, uh, negative, um, a replication intermediate of the pegiviruses uh, in bone marrow in uh, CD4 positive cells, but we really don't have a great handle on how the effect is being mediated. But it is interesting to note that the pegiviruses uh, fall into a class of uh, viruses that we call semi-persistent. So that means that um, after someone is infected, they're typically viremic for about 18 months on average, after which time, if they're immunocompetent, they typically seroconvert, so they don't develop antibodies for 18 months. When they do develop antibodies, the, viremia, the, the, the uh, plasma viremia goes away. Uh, if you have HIV, 
you almost, uh, you rarely seroconvert. So if people who have HIV remain persistently uh, pegiviric, viremic indefinitely. And so the thinking is that these viruses are doing something to mask themselves for the, from the immune system in a way that takes the immune system some 18 months to mount an antibody response, despite the fact that they're replicating to a titer that we can measure, typically about 10 to the sixth viral genome equivalents per mil of plasma. We, we can measure plenty of virus in the blood, but we can't culture it, and the immune system doesn't seem to want to recognize it. So it's really enigmatic. Do they replicate in the mucosa? We don't think so. The only place we've ever been able to, you know, consistently document replication is bone marrow and spleen. Um, yeah, I had a quick question about, so did you say you're proposing to change your housing paradigm or you have changed it in terms of looking at transmissibility with social pairs and stuff or is it in, under discussion? So I want to, I want to bring this up again. This is something that I thought would be provocative. Um, I'll, I'll be honest. Um, if anyone from Wisconsin is listening, hi, and I'm not trying to throw you under the bus here, but there is a tendency uh, for the vets to be very, very conservative and want, not want to be the one that sticks their neck out too far from where the other ones are. And so at our center, we've had lots of discussions about it. I'm going with one of our pediatric ID docs to meet with all the animal care staff to talk about this um, in the next couple of months um, to try to start this dialogue. But there has been a real reluctance to change the housing paradigm because no one else has. And so I don't know if that's true, if other people here have changed their housing paradigms. Um, if we can start that conversation, for me, that would be fantastic. Hey, Jeremy. Yeah, Jeremy Smedley, uh, OHSU, uh, Oregon National Primate Center. So we do that. Uh, we we uh, do have a number of our animals that are on antiretroviral therapy. And for that phase of the study, we do, we do co-house them. We do pair house them, uh, not during the acute viremia phase before we suppress, but, but right. absolutely uh, during the suppression phase. And then depending on the study and the outcomes, uh, we may, you know, separate those animals if we're looking for a, a viral rebound or whatnot outcome where there's going to be potential differences there. So uh, we definitely uh, take in, into account just what you're saying and, and manage our studies based on that. Yeah, if the virus is going to come back, you absolutely don't want to pose a risk. But have you seen anything adverse happen when your animals that are undetectable have been pair housed with other, with other animals? Just, just standard pair housing stuff, injuries yeah. and the like. But, but uh, nothing but, specific to the SIV, <laughs> right? Not, nothing nothing uh, directly related to the SIV, not when they're suppressed. If it's the same arm or the vaccine or whatever, what's the risk in pair housing? Isn't the same risk? Super infection would be one. I mean, but again, this is, this is why I think it's an important conversation. And a lot of it is also based on low dose uh, acquisition, and so if an animal. Yeah, and we do the same thing uh, once we determine whether they're progressors or controllers. Uh, we, the, the controllers, we, we pair house as well. The progressors tend to head towards uh, a knee graft. One, one more question. Jonas Sasha from OHSU again. Hi, Dave. Big fan. Uh, <laughs> To be clear, Jonah's last words to me before I stepped up here were, don't shame yourself. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so to go to this, this paradigm shift, you know, it occurs to me we actually just went through this because we have been setting up a macaque model of hepatitis B virus, which for all intents and purposes, you know, we encounter hepatitis B positive people all the time. And when we first started these studies, OHSU made us do this at a level two plus, like it was an SIV. And we thought that was pretty ridiculous considering people were at the hospital and level two, and we actually successfully had it reviewed and changed where those HPV-infected animals will now be housed in level two. So there is some credence to, to this logical approach. Thank you. <laughs>